Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to welcome you uh, at the third panel today. I know that we are in the difficult position to be the last ones uh, after so many interesting words being mentioned here during the previous discussions, but uh, let's hope our topic is uh, so important and interesting that uh, we are going to keep you not sleeping <laughs> and in good spirits. Uh, let me welcome my distinguished guests uh, from my left, uh, Mr. Patrick Oksanen. Uh, Patrick Oksanen is a Swedish award-winning editorial writer and author. As a political editor in the Mid Media News Group, he has covered the downsides of the information era and how both states and extremists are using online influence in order to suppress free speech and undermine democracy. He's been widely quoted by uh, worldwide media such as New York Times, Newsweek, as well as being attacked by Sputnik News. Welcome, Patrick. Uh, Mrs. Ludm uh, Lenka Bradachova, I'm sorry, uh, is a Czech lawyer and prosecutor who has been a high state attorney in Prague since 2012. She graduated in law and jurisprudence at the law faculty of Charles University. From March 2008 to April 2014, she served as president of the Union of Prosecutors of the Czech Republic. Lenka Bradachova takes part in many teaching activities, for example, through the Judicial Academy of the Czech Republic and the Police Academy of the Czech Republic. Welcome. Mr. Bob Kartos is an analyst and spokesperson of education fintech EduIn. He has been a regular educational commentator in many Czech media. Besides that, he is editor of Czech Critical Internet Daily, Britské listy, and is a spokesperson to Czech Elves, voluntarily founded group of professionals who try to fight against disinformation in cyberspace. Welcome, Mr. Kartos. And Ms. Ludmila Savchuk. She is a Russian journalist and a social activist. She began her career as an independent journalist in St. Petersburg and was an active participant, organizer, and press speaker of public activist movements. After spending a year studying the activity of proclaiming bloggers and commentators on the internet, she began working at St. Petersburg Troll Factory in 2015, pretending to be an ordinary employee while in fact conducting an investigation into staff. In two months, she gathered valuable material on, on work of uh, the paid-for commentators worrying against ordinary internet users. She published her findings and she now gives lectures and spreads information about this issue internationally. Welcome, Savchuk. Our topic is very wide and quite complicated. Is the fight against disinformation, the digital uh, media era, and our role in it uh, as public servants, as journalists, uh, and as ordinary citizens as well. Uh, first of all, because not all of you do this professionally, some of you have the disinformation, fighting of disinformation as uh, maybe like a second job or even a hobby in a sense. I would like to ask you what drives you personally to uh, fight against disinformation? In what way do you find it important, maybe for yourselves or generally? And are we in hybrid war? Because some people say it's not a hybrid war and uh, we should not use this expression. So uh, maybe, Patrick, if you can start and we will follow from your left. The importance of, of this issue, I would just state very, very simple. This is defining the world in this century and, and what kind of world we will live in and die in later. Uh, it's not uh, more and not less than that. And on your question about hybrid warfare, you can call it whatever you would like to, but the lines between war and peace in the information era is blurred and we see this on the global level right now in a scale that we haven't seen for, for uh, many years. 
maybe when I'm still with you, you uh, in your resume and CV wrote that you were attacked by Sputnik News. Maybe can you uh, just uh, clarify this? In what way were you harassed? Yeah. I, I have been uh, been targeted uh, uh, in in several ways, but the thing with Sputnik, and I think that this this is a very fun story because it says a lot about how this information is working. Uh, Sputnik took a quote from the foreign minister Sergei Lavrov and used that quote in order to to attack me and state that, that my my writing was ludicrous. Uh, and it is correct that he said that, but he said that some three months before in a total different context uh, than I wrote my column. So here you have the Russian state media taking a quote from the foreign minister in a total different context, putting it into a new context in order to disinform the public. Mm. I would uh, continue with Mrs. Lenka Bradáčová. Um, uh, let me take this opportunity and uh, speak in Czech and I think uh, 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 because I want to be very precise, I think it is necessary for me to express myself in, uh, in, in Czech because I'm going to speak about law and I want to be very, very precise and specific. Uh, in the course of my practice as a public prosecutor, I came over a problem several times, a problem which I saw as a key and essential problem. It was in a context of analyzing information and messages on social media, on the internet. and. Because the space or the environment of social me, uh, media has a media has a very different situation when it comes to uh, obtaining evidence and when it comes to violation of uh, privacy uh, and protection of privacy of correspondence, we were confronted with a particular difference and purpose of laws and regulations which set certain obligations for traditional media on one hand and then uh, media of this new type, uh, let's, let's call it that way, but this new media will be quite commonplace within several years and they have uh, when it comes to their rights and obligations, there are major differences. For me, it is quite key and essential that the traditional publishing houses, uh, which publish printed media, but have also presence on the internet, also informed through these modern means of communication, these media are subject to very specific rules which had existed for many years, and that's the Press Act. And the Press Act, if it were, had not been needed, then it would not be so frequently amended or perhaps even revoked, and the whole area of publishing would remain unregulated. It's not the case. It is. It continues to be very strictly regulated because governments understand how important information uh, informing the public and giving information to the public, how, inform, how important it is, and therefore it associates it with number uh, with a number of rights and obligations and then on the other hand you have other entities companies or individuals uh, which provide information to the public in a very similar fashion but because they do not fit the definition of a publishing house in the traditional notion, they are not subject to these obligations. And for me, traditional media, for me personally, it um, always involved in my eyes the responsibility or liability for the information it, it is being 
that is being handed over. That's why there are editorial policies. That's why there is a certain history of these publishing houses uh, which bear responsibility for the information they provide to the public. And today, we do not have these, the same kind of obligation for publishers on the internet. When you look at the press media, uh, the press act, uh, there um, is an obligation for the publishing house to identify itself to the reader. That is, the reader understands who is the subject entity responsible for the information and from whom it can claim certain liability if, if it comes to that. Uh, and this is not with, uh, uh, this is not the same case with the internet me media. For me, it is important to understand uh, whether it's an individual or a company providing the information. It is very important to know the identity of that information provider that, uh, that um, identity must not be covered up. It must be understood what are the sources of information and uh, what uh, the, the, the informer is basing itself on. And it also helps me to claim, um, to make certain claims. And this is what is missing uh, from uh, in, in the internet uh, sphere. And this, this is why we have the Press Act and we also have the civil code to regulate that. And uh, seeking liability from those who violate our personal rights, uh, uh, we are not really skilled at um, addressing that. And if you have the, any kind of dispute uh, of uh, regarding uh, violation of personal rights or personality disputes, these are very few that go to the court. And this allows then for uh, expressions of hatred to be expressed on uh, the internet. There are messages that incite hatred, and this falls into the category of criminal uh, of criminal law. But even criminal law needs to be more principally enforced here. Uh, but I believe the obligation to identify one, oneself to, uh, uh, to the reader, this certainly is not a violation of uh, the freedom of speech. Um, follow up on uh, what Mrs. Bradacheva said, or if you want to present uh, your point of view on uh, your personal strife with disinformation campaigns. Thank, thank, thank you for invitation. Uh, I have, <laughs> uh, honestly, two uh, very important reasons why I try to participate in countering disinformation in Czech uh, Republic. The first one is uh, deeply personal because one of my uh, close relatives is uh, under really a uh, huge impact of disinformation as a daily regular consumer of disinformation spreading uh, around the Czech uh, cyberspace via so-called change uh, or sorry chain emails. Uh, this is uh, kind of specific of uh, the way how disinformation is uh, circulating around the Czech, uh, Czech internet, and uh, I've been witnessing uh, for many years how this very close uh, human being to me is changing his mind. And it is uh, deeply concerning how big impact could uh, this information uh, have on people in Czech Republic. And the second reason is uh, that what I can see is really uh, a huge impact on some political and uh, social issues in Czech Republic. Uh, we can see really effective leverage of disinformation on some political decisions of really a uh, big part of Czech society and we can witness how uh, some political parties in Czech Republic try to uh, misuse this, this information as a 
political tool, as a political vehicle. And uh, this is the second uh, really important reason uh, why I am really convinced that not only me or Czech elves, uh, will, as, as, as said, voluntarily uh, created a group which tries to fight against the disinformation uh, that we need uh, to do something more and uh, to stand up against the uh, disinformation, against the uh, impact it uh, has on uh, social, political issues and perspectivity of not only Czech society, but global society. That those are two reasons why I try to do something. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And if we can hear uh, Ms. Savchuk. Ответственность, когда мы приступаем к борьбе с дезинформацией, начинается с себя. Это, наверное, очень простая мысль, но я сейчас поясню, что я имею в виду. It is a very important question that is asked. It is the question of responsibility or liability in the context of information distribution. And here, in this context of responsibility, you have to start with yourself. It may sound simple, but I'll try to explain. Whenever we adopt positions on this topic, we all play a specific role. You have mentioned that there is responsibility, and this responsibility lies with the official media, but we see today that there are the so-called troll farms today, and uh, some official media start resembling these farms or factories. The European media that are generally considered to be free and unbiased, if they want to talk about this issue in the Russian Federation, they come to see us, and they know in advance what they want to say. They have already prepare, prepared the uh, concept of what they want, want to talk, and I myself fall, fell victim of such an approach. An example, the work of uh, the Washington Post that published uh, documents connected to the list of the people. It's the sanction list of the people who were apparently involved in the interfer interference with American elections. So I was approached by the journalist. They contacted me as an expert who has been working in the area, who has been active in uh, talking about fake media dis disinformation and who talked about the troll firm. And later on, a, an article was published saying for what reason I myself was not on the list.
И они, к сожалению, оказались вовлечены в эту информационную кампанию и стали частью этой огромной информационного, дезинформационного облака. Many publishing houses that are presented as the official media, not the disinformation media, however, are in the middle of the campaign and become a part of disinformation campaigns. For this reason, I believe that the question should be, we all should answer why we do it whether it is because of the career that we want to pursue or because we want to bring new documents or we want to show ourselves at the vic as the victim of the regime or we want to present ourselves as the hero. And that is why I said at the beginning that we have to start with us. Uh, quite nice free lines of responsibility, our own personal responsibility, responsibility of states uh, and Western democracies and responsibility of traditional media as well, because as Ludmila uh, hinted, uh, that it's actually not just the alter, we can't blame everything on uh, alternative uh, media and trolling farms, because the disintegration of societies definitely is much more complex than just uh, some trolls writing their posts on the social media somewhere in St. Petersburg, for example. Uh, but Ludmila, I would like to uh, ask you one more thing, because you are the only uh, actor, or like you are the only person here who has really gone inside. Uh, and I don't think that uh, it would be fair for our, our audience to miss your private experience from uh, the troll farm, which you infiltrated in St. Petersburg. So maybe if you could just uh, summarize or shortly explain us how it works, uh, in what way is it effective, and what are the aims? If you were told, for example, you have to write this and this amount of uh, posts, but also what was the aim? If there was some kind of direction in which uh, you were told to go. Первый журналист, который внедрился на фабрику троллей, до меня это сделали два журналиста оппозиционных изданий в Петербурге. Это было еще в 2014 году, но они внедрились буквально на подход к расследованию этой организации я подумала, что для того, чтобы понять механизм их работы, нужно находиться там как можно дольше. They had a traditional approach to the investigation of this particular issue, but I believe that if I want to understand, I had to stay longer there. Before I worked as a freelancer and a colleague of mine with whom I cooperated in the journal invited me to apply for the job in a company where she had been working already for one month approximately and it was a troll factory as I discovered. <laughs> It was a chance. 
It was an opportunity for me to go inside and see how it works. And the very first piece of information I got was that you work nonstop, that there are no public holidays, there is no free time. For instance, I started working there during the New Year's Eve and everything was working full speed. My first working day was the 2nd of uh, January, where an average Russian is usually uh, impossible, uh, is uh, really sick and cannot work because of the celebrations. As I have said, the troll factory works non-stop 24-7, no weekends, and people cannot have a rest even not for a while. The first thing that you are impressed with is the scope of work and the organization of the work. The the person who called it for the first time the Troll Factory found a really good name for it. It is an organization that um, produces every second different types of contents, articles, pictures, memos, uh, videos, any type of output. The first instruction a troll, an employee, gets, whether you write or create any type of content, is that it must be ordinary, it must be human, it must be fun, it must be sad, it must be emotional. And the employee can invent his or her identity, name, uh, sex, nationality, address, whatever. And the first thing you do once you arrive is that you switch on your computer and automatically a program protecting from localization is switched on too. A troll works very much like uh, an ordinary journalist in a journal that is regulated. In other words, he gets or she gets technical job descriptions. In other words, the information the troll gets is first on what topic, how it should be written, and another important element is that the troll knows in advance what message should be uh, provided to the reader. And the colleague who invited me to come instructed me that it must be simple and natural. Uh, 
In other words, if we cover the U.S. or Europe, it will be only negative. If we write about Putin, it will be always positive. And we, if we cover the opposition, we have to point out all the negative points. I joined a team that had quite a difficult task. It was a whole team that focused on one task. In Russia, the Russians like people who have some supernatural uh, capacities, the people who can predict the future and so on. In our TV, it's quite common that you can see strangers who can make miracles and uh, it's broadcast in our media. And the common task we had was connected to a woman called Contadora. I do not know who invented the name, a woman who was supposed to live in St. Petersburg, and she was someone who was able to make miracles. And, for instance, anybody could in could visit her and uh, went through a ritual with her in order to become happy and uh, successful. Or, for instance, people could turn to her and ask for advice. For instance, uh, does it make sense to move to a European country? And Contadora very often uh, told that very often she's contacted by people who ask, should we move to another European country? And repeatedly she would say, no, definitely no, do not go to Europe. Europe is in danger, and the only place where you can have a happy life is Russia. I would even say, if we talk about the fight against this propaganda, about this phenomenon, I would say the more effort and money is directed there, the less we see the propaganda there, because the Propaganda was dosed in uh, very small quantities, and it was uh, always very careful, and uh, it was not exaggerated. What is also interesting to note is that you can become owners of uh, many accounts. You can work on Facebook, on Twitter, on many other platforms, and you will always have a different identity. Uh, uh, who is paying for those uh, trolling farms, officially or unofficially? It is paid by the Russian taxpayers. Propaganda, 
так и за малочисленные а, а, тролльские фабрики. We pay not only for the public TV, which is the traditional medium, but we also pay for the numerous troll farms that we have operating in Russia. On the internet, there was also a whole package of documents showing that this specific troll factory is controlled from the office of the president and paid from his office. It's like they, they keep denying that there, there would be uh, such an existence of uh, something like uh, trolling farms. Maybe uh, Bob would like to uh, react on that as well. Yeah, I think that it's absolutely obvious that uh, the tactics, technologies are more or less the same. Uh, if you compare uh, uh, this witness, uh, the eyes witness from Russia and the Czech Republic, what, what this, what differs, uh, it uh, could be the content of uh, this information. Uh, some of those disinformation uh, con uh, uh, contents uh, circulating uh, in, in, Czech, uh, in Czech internet are the same. Uh, reason is really clear because there is a kind of small injection uh, from the side of the uh, Russia trolling apparatus uh, into the Czech cyberspace but it is effectively spreading around by the people we can uh, call them, I don't know, uh, useful idiots and people, and this is a major part, they really trust that some alternative uh, point of views, alternative explanations of reality are uh, something uh, what uh, is worth it to think about at least. And, uh, what we can see in Czech Republic uh, and what differs uh, from the situation in, uh, in Russia, according to the last report of Czech Elves, uh, which is uh, uh, publicly uh, uh, available on the internet, uh, you can find uh, part of the disinformation content which tries to, for example, advocate some, uh, some politicians, some political parties in Czech Republic. Uh, uh, the most visible benefiters of disinformation in Czech Republic, and I uh, can be uh, really uh, uh, specific, uh, are, for example, Mr. 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 Miloš Zeman, uh, President of Czech Republic. But uh, you can find uh, the plenty of uh, disinformation contents which try to advocate, uh, for example, the Prime Minister Andrei Babiš uh, in his politics, in his uh, uh, confidence in, uh, in, in his personality and uh, this is kind of mixture of uh, uh, disinformation which uh, creates really big chaos. Some of those uh, information you can find or disinformation you can find also in uh, so-called traditional media because uh, as, it, uh, as it was said uh, Traditional media uh, sometimes uh, under the pressure of the, uh, of the changing environment and changing economics try to uh, accommodate or adapt to new reality uh, in interfering digital space and uh, very often try to uh, misuse the sentiment and uh, uh, kind of uh, sensations which, which really uh, increasing uh, 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 the audience and, uh, and the interest of the public and uh, this is something that is very toxic and uh, uh, all those results we can, uh, we can see really uh, in the political decisions and in the rhetorics of some uh, political parties because uh, many of them, uh, the populist ones, uh, but also some uh, personalities in, in so-called traditional political parties they try to really serve on this uh, on this wave uh, of disinformation and uh, and on this wave of uh, information chaos well from my point of view as a, as a practicing journalist uh, I, I I take part of the blame as well like for us the traditional media because I think that with the 
uh, with the new digital media as such and social media, uh, we kind of, and you are mentioning the economic uh, yeah. pressure, you know, because media, instead of uh, basically becoming analytical, they want sexy articles, you know, like th that is connected with the economic uh, uh, economy of the, of the media. Uh, and everything is so fast and the media uh, nowadays, they actually press their reporters to be active on social media and to post their comments non-stop basically. It's not just writing or reporting, it's you have to be online and post your comments on social media, which I think personally is in a complete like opposition to what a journalist or traditional journalist is supposed to do because you have to find out facts, not just comment on everything immediately. That's more about emotion and not about facts and analysis, right? So I think that, yes, in that part we are to blame. But what is interesting, uh, especially for the future, and maybe I would like to uh, ask you, Patrick, how do we, because Mrs. Bradacheva mentioned that she thinks that the line between the traditional media and the alternative media is going to be more blurry and more blurry and maybe in coming years, they will become the same platform, you know, like people will simply choose, I want this or this or this. The, the, the uh, alternative media might not have the label, which they still have, at least in some circles, as, be, as being something like, eh, you know, they are like not t to be trusted. So uh, what do you think the traditional media should do? What is their fight for the future? I, I do agree with you that, that the traditional journalists have problems in this. And what we are seeing is that, the, I mean, the core of the con context of truth is under attack in this new media landscape. And the way for traditional journalists to handle that cannot be to adopt to the sentiments of the algorithm of the social tech giants. Mm. Uh, instead, I argue that we need to, to go back and, and strengthen the ethics, the quality, uh, rules, etc., etc., of journalism and being more transparent in these methods and also state that in a new way to the readers. And here is one thing that I, I think is, is sad about quick journalists today, and that is the rewrite. Uh, you make a story of another journalist story who might have done a story on a story. Uh, yes. And basically what you're reporting and saying in your reporting of the rewrite of the rewrite is, hey, I have no clue of anything of this, but it sounds good, so read this on your own risk. I mean, if we made that mark, uh, that would be good information for the reader because proper journalists should be checking the facts. But I also would like to, to widen up the picture because this is a global problem. Uh, in a newly released report from Oxford University, it stated that they have found these kinds of manipulation in social media in 70 countries. In two years, these figures have more than doubled. And, and we're seeing this happening very quickly now all around the globe. And, and I mean, the reason is, is simple, because the algorithm, they, they support the anger, the disgust, and the sentiments of the people, not the balanced, perhaps uh, uh, moderate view. And it does not support uh, facts, because it's, uh, I mean, the truth is usually dull. The lie is more exciting. And in this, you also see the increase of actors using these methods against other countries. This report states there are seven countries using these methods on others. Uh, Russia is, of course, one of them, mm -hmm. but it's not about the US election. We have China as well, now increasing uh, the footprint. And here, it was a report from Twitter and Australian researchers that I thought was really interesting connecting the attack on the brave demonstrators in Hong Kong uh, on Twitter, also with Chinese attacks on the Swedish uh, book publisher Gi Min Hai, who was kidnapped and brought to China and is now in Chinese prison. Same Twitter accounts were used in attacking Hong Kong 
and I'm attacking the human hive. So we see this on a global scale trying to, to change the views of people in many countries. Mm. Uh, actually, this same study, when you already mentioned it, it's, it was just published recently, like a couple of days ago. It was a study of Oxford researchers. And they uh, found out that uh, you mentioned 70 countries. Uh, like, let me quote that in Vietnam, citizens enlisted to post pro government messages on personal Facebooks. In Ethiopia, for example, uh, the government hired people to influence uh, their voters through their own uh, social media accounts. Is this legally somehow manageable? I mean, Mrs. Berdachova, I mean, like, you can't probably legally uh, somehow influence people's own personal accounts. But maybe on the other hand, you could uh, legally uh, push on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Já si dovolím nejdřív reagovat na to, co tu zaznělo. Um, First respond to what we have heard uh, from the troll factory. It was said here that the first thing that happens is that uh, a device is switched on that prevents localization. And that's what I was saying early on. That's about the identity of the publisher. The uh, strength of the disinformation lies in the fact that you have no way to verify who is behind that information. Because if the reader knew that the information is paid by Kremlin, the reader may read it with a different eye. Maybe not, but he may. And uh, on the social uh, uh, media or social networks. I will say something rather banal, but I believe it is quite important. Social networks enable communication and enable dissemination of information to starting from young children to uh, our grandparents who couldn't have even thought when they were young that something like uh, that will have existed one day. And the information that is spread through this network is viewed differently by the old generation. And for the future, it should be, and the young in the future should be also viewing it differently. And there is a role of uh, education and rearing. If we tell children when they are young that they cannot run across the road because they may be run over by a car, they also need to be taught that there are certain rules and dangers uh, inherent in in um, the cyberspace, inherent to the cyberspace. And this is the banal comment I wanted to make, or very simple comment, and when I teach children about this, or when I lecture to children about this, the children uh, open their accounts on social networks, and the companies that provide these accounts have in their conditions certain criteria. And one of the criterion is that the child should only do what they do, that is open the account, as of certain age. Most children who share these accounts and open these accounts, they lie in the entry form and provide fictitious age. And I'm asking these children in my lectures, why are you lying? And they say, because we have to in order to be given access. But why do you think that all the others who are there and whose information you take over, why do you think they don't lie? Don't they lie as well? Because you lied to begin with. You lie about your identity but assume that the information they receive from the others without verifying this information, that it may be on a basis of a lie as well. And if we teach young children to be critical, to think critically about such information, 
then I believe we can manage the danger that is coming out of the cyberspace. But it's a long way to go. Before we come back to the legal frames, maybe Bob would like to mention something uh, in this connection because that is your uh, field. Yeah, that's my field. Uh, yeah, sure. Do you think that media education in this sense is enough? Yeah, I think that the problem we are talking about uh, is very close to the, uh, to the educational reform and uh, we really try to uh, push it hard forward because uh, society, global society is like a turtle the slowly creeping behind, far behind the technological progress. Yeah, this is a big problem. Social adaptability is much slower than technological progress. Yeah. And we need to try really rapidly to change uh, all the environment, not only the legal environment, but also the education. But it's very important to uh, stress out that this is a good point from Mrs. Bradachova, but uh, this is a long-term horizon. Yeah. If we are talking about education and the change education, we uh, can expect some results in the horizon of decades. Uh, that means that if uh, in an absolutely uh, ideal situation, uh, we are able now, today or tomorrow, change the curriculum of, uh, of, uh, of education, of public education, okay, but we can find the results uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. And this is a long-term horizon. In short-term horizon, we, the only way how to resolve this problem is try to push those who are responsible for the distri distribution of uh, information and disinformation too uh, for really significantly higher responsibility. That means uh, not only uh, the approach or availability uh, for young uh, people to be a part of the social networks, but also how the algorithm works, uh, as, as it was said. Uh, it's very important because uh, people are not aware that they are exposed to only the content uh, which is uh, selected on the uh, thousands of characteristics of their behavior they do on the internet. Uh, and this is a problem. They, they are not aware about it. Uh, they are not aware about the fact that there is a many, many different information, many, many different contents, uh, which uh, could be available, but aren't. Uh, those are uh, maybe three, uh, the biggest uh, companies or corporations, uh, which are the so big tech giants. Uh, that means the Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, European Commission uh, has been trying to uh, negotiate somehow uh, the code of practice, code of conduct with uh, those big, uh, big technology companies. But what I can see, uh, the progress is very slow. It, it's not effective enough. And uh, what I can see from the side of those companies, uh, this is something like an attempt to uh, uh, play two games at the same time. Uh, to be very polite, uh, very cautious uh, in negotiations with some big uh, international uh, bodies like uh, European Commission or I don't know, US government. But at the same time, they do really uh, less to change uh, something in the digital environment, uh, to change something uh, towards uh, to better control uh, around who is a producer, who is a distributor of this information. And uh, this is just only uh, because of uh, uh, they are really fear that it will somehow uh, affect their revenues. Thank you very uh, We have like 15 minutes left and there's still so much we have to, uh, to, to, uh, to go into. Uh, but Ms. Mrs. Bradshaw, I wanted to just uh, follow on uh, Mr. Cartos. But Two minutes. like what, what uh, like uh, maybe I still will add to your question because it is uh, a question for you as well. I think that legally we are really like behind, you know, like the legal steps, of course, uh, because it takes time to <laughs> to like not only enforce the law, but to make the law and uh, the laws properly. Uh, so, I mean, like, w is there some changes which are going to be 
enforced soon, not maybe in two, three years, but soon, because most of the security analysts, they are actually uh, saying we need to, we need a speedy reaction. We need a reaction as soon as possible, uh, not only when some disinformation comes uh, into the digital space, but also legally. Uh, so I'm asking, for example, I know that in Lithuania, uh, they started banning uh, Russian TV disinformation channels through legal steps. So is this some, something like that being prepared in Czech Republic or in European <coughs> Union? Uh, well, this is a very complex issue, especially because the European Union, of course, is uh, based on some principles and uh, fundamental values. These are the basic values of democratic states. And uh, it's very difficult to find tools that would not intervene in the freedoms on which the countries are based, such as the freedom of speech or the freedom to distribute information. But on the other side, we have the public protection, security protection, protection of data. We have GDPR on data, which is the sensitive personal data that we protect. So we are searching for a sort of balance, for a balanced solution. And uh, we are looking for this balance with measures adopted not only by the EU, but also in individual member countries. I cannot see any other solution than that we will have to take away some rights and add some obligations. Well, on the one side, we have uh, the possibility to block some sites or platforms or portals or servers. It is a problem that is well known and understood by law. The state can do it, but when using these tools, the state has to be very careful because the state must not violate the fundamental principles and freedoms. And this is a very difficult balance to find. And uh, in the countries that are not based on the respect for the fundamental values and principles, then they can opt for a very aggressive solution. They will simply block the information and do not make the distinction whether it is censorship or whether it's a procedure that is uh, legal at the borderline of censorship, or if there is criminal act committed, then it is necessary in order to, to keep public order. But they'll simply decide to block information because the state doesn't want this information to be available to the citizens. But this is not possible in democratic liberal countries because it would be a violation of the fundamental values that we preach. And now, to find this balanced approach, it is a very complicated issue. But the countries also have to understand that, at least in the areas where some information is labeled as beyond the borderline, that means it should be punished as criminal acts or administrative uh, 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 violation and so on. In other words, if there is this situation, then it must be very strictly sanctioned, not only in the real world, but also in the virtual world, because the virtual world is basically the mirror of the real world. Whatever happens in the real world must happen in the virtual world, too. So there must be cons consistency of sanctions in the two worlds. And we consider this issue as a very difficult issue, but unfortunately it has not happened yet in none of the democratic countries, not even in the, no, not in the post-communist countries either, because we still have difficulties understanding the internet. We still do not understand that whatever we do in the real world should be requested in the virtual world, and we do not have this approach yet. Because I think it's excellent put the problems we have in a democracy, how to strike this fine balance. And we should be aware of two things. There is no silver bullet, there is no simple solution, and there is not one solution to handle this problem. And on the other hand, 
I stress the time frame. We don't have decades to fix this. Technology develops very fast. Artificial intelligence is, is coming in a higher speed. And we also have deep fake. Uh, that's the concept of a video that is not actually taking place. We could make a video from this conversation and we are all praising Mr. Putin and Xi Jinping, some of the great leaders of the world. You can manipulate videos like that. And that throws away the concept of the moving image and that we have learned to trust as authenticity in a, in a total new way. And, and here we come back to the problem, how to organize information in this interconnected internet world with such high speed and with social media going through the world in a pace that we could not imagine decades ago. Uh, and that is the key issue to solve, together with the personal responsibility, together with enforcing the law when it comes to hate speech, etc., etc. But we must realize we're in for a ride. And to quote the classical movie from 1939, The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy says, we're not in Kansas anymore. And we need to realize we are not in Kansas. And we need to wake up and see it's a brave new world. And it's a mess. Just to give one more question from the, uh, from the oh, sorry, you wanted to react to this. Okay. <laughs> Just one remark, thank you. I think that in the post-communist countries, the issue of conflict between the possible restriction of the fundamental right of uh, spreading information and the other notions such as public security and public order, the issue here is probably more sensitive than in the other member countries of the EU. I'll give you an example. The Council of Europe countries implemented in their legal framework, in the penal code, a tool that makes it possible for the police of each of the state to block specific content, to make the distribution of specific content impossible on the internet. And here we have an enormous, uh, lively discussion about this modification of the penal code. This new tool triggered very emotional reactions from both the media, the public, and many other institutions, because the first idea that comes to your mind is not we have to protect ourselves and we have to act uh, against uh, criminal acts and propaganda. Not the first idea is this is uh, an attempt to limit our freedom of speech. And all the other legitimate objectives are not discussed at all. The only discussion is about is it or is it not too much? Isn't it a tool in the hands of the state to limit the freedom of speech? Like a really complex and uh very difficult question, and I think we are going to face this really and discuss this very much in the very near future or in the coming years. Uh, but Ludmila, let me ask you the last question because we have really few minutes left. Uh, or the audience is asking, there are five reactions to it. What was the reaction of the Russian regime uh, on your activity and uh, like Uh, writing about the tro troll farms. Uh, in connection to that, I would like to ask you, because I don't know to what depth you want to go in describing, descri describing this. I know that from some security reasons you didn't really want to go too much into this. But I think that at least according to the future analysts of future of disinformation, they say that uh, the social media and the future of this information is going to be much more personified. Uh, that each of us, when disliked by somebody or by some regime, could have their own personal troll, just trolling them personally and making this information tailored to a person. Do you think that this is going to be, or this is, uh, 
a serious problem. And as well, do you think that personal responsibility could work from the other side as well? That actually we would make uh, the people who do trolling somehow sanctioned, that it could work as a punishment, kind of. Первая часть вопроса. Режим отреагировал еще больше, еще больше информационной травли, но уже лично меня там организовывали целые компании. So the response of the Russian regime, uh, there was a defamation campaign against me personally. That was the step number one. And uh, it was not uh, only uh, within this uh, troll farm. It was uh, Russia Today and other media that were, um, you know, defaming me and, and, and talking badly about me on all levels. У него сразу появляются персональные тролли, причем не только в интернете и в СМИ, но и в реальной жизни. Your second question on personalized messages and personalized trolling, I think it uh, actually even exists. Uh, and uh, it is done against specific activists, activists who, uh, let's say, fight against some small local problem, uh, cutting down trees. They will get sort of tailor-made, personalized hate messages instantly. certainly know that we uh, had uh, gubernatorial uh, elections and also municipal elections in Russia recently. And uh, whenever uh, there was a person from the group of activists who wanted to be active in po politics and run for uh, an office, uh, a machine started working, trolling, police arrests, uh, defamations, and, and whatnot. In St. Petersburg, uh, the uh, troll um, uh, factory, we could not even say that they were interfering with these elections. The factory was actually managing the, uh, the gubernatorial elections. By way of uh, an example, I can mention uh, an acquaintance of mine who wanted to run for the governor of St. Petersburg. And uh, in one, um, one day, there were 700 uh, defamation articles, not only on social networks, but in um, uh, regular uh, media. So yes, you can say that these, there are personalized trolls sanctions against particular people who do actually spread this information. Mm -hmm. That was the last part of my question because I know that yeah. you wanted to mention that it mm -hmm. might be <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of, of uh, this mechanism. No. 
но у нас есть хотя бы такая, такая возможность дождаться, когда США объявят санкции против кого-то из пропагандистов. Quite helpless when it comes to these techniques and and how to uh, find fight them. The uh, only way to go is to hope for these specific sanctions to be introduced by the U.S. against individuals who are responsible for disinformation. One of them organized a march with me, offering money to my colleagues, activists. Uh, speaking about the list, uh, the list of uh, people, individuals who are under sanctions by the U.S. because they were interfering with the U.S. Uh, elections uh, two weeks ago, two new names were added to this uh, list, one of them is a member of the troll factory where I was working, and uh, he was also responsible for the defamation of uh, defamation campaign against me, and he was also offering money to obtain any negative information about me in order to use it in that campaign. And going back to this personal responsibility, again, I, I think this is something that could help, that is uncovering the identity of the person, because this person was identified and publicly disclosed who it was, so uh, that, that uh, could help. We are all fighting in our own private ways as well. Uh, Thank you all for participating in really interesting discussion. Thank you also for your energy and courage uh, in uh, uh, this journey, which is not easy at all. And thank you to the audience. Um, this is the end of our discussion, and uh, we are just uh, going to see the final goodbye and the closing. <laughs> thank you very much.